Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and we'll, we'll begin. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of gathering together like-minded believers and of spending our time and our thought on the plans of your specification and on the, uh, the means of reaching this world, this huge population. Father, we pray that you would make us always more efficient and more knowledgeable in our work for you. We pray these blessings will be furthered to some degree this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're going to be looking at, at city mission work a.k.a. medical missionary work, uh, and, and put it into a historical focus. I come at this from a, basically an Adventist history point of view. Um, that's been my interest, and the Lord has blessed over the years to put a lot of pieces of history, information, kind of drop them into my lap. And that's what has made this topic stand out as the best hope. For Seventh-day Adventism, you know, sometimes you can look at the task we've been given and say, this, this, this is not a prayer here. Yeah. Well, there is, when we do it God's way, okay? None of us, none of us, myself included, really know enough yet about this topic. I'm not standing here saying, oh, I got this all figured out. I'm saying, hey, God has said, let's head this direction. There's a lot to learn. So, but I do want to help put it into some um, historical context Medical missionary work, and this work for the cities in particular, is more tied up with more topics of interest in Seventh-day Adventism than anything else that I know of. Okay? Everything is tied uh, very intricately to medical missionary work, Isaiah 58 type of thing. We've got a whole presentation, which I'm not going to give now, but um, Righteousness by Faith, the Day of Atonement, uh, 1888, um, message to Laodicea, the last call to the supper. Uh, what else can I think of? Uh, the reason, do you know, do anybody remember, you know, Battle Creek had some fires 110 years ago, right? The sanitarium burned down in January and the Review and Herald burned. You know why? Because they weren't doing Isaiah 58, as the Spirit of Prophecy tells us, okay? Everything ties to that. And so I want to, to give you some context. Um, very, very quickly, um, and I'm going to have to just assert a lot of things without all the full documentation. I'll just put a plug in repeatedly along the way here. Um, everything I'm talking about comes from well-documented sources. They're all available on my website, which I'll put up on the screen at the end of the, uh, the, end of the occasion here. Um, and you'll be able to, uh, to go get all that at that time or whenever you, you want. Um, and I'm having some computer problems, but we'll get that going here. And it'll take us just a moment. Um, okay, let that sit. John Harvey Kellogg was converted in 1888 at Minneapolis. Oh, I said so in 1903. Okay, I didn't know that until recently. Uh, when he was converted, now he'd already been the medical director of the sanitarium for 12 years. Okay, it's not like he'd been the town drunk. Uh, it's, you know, it's not like he hadn't been going to church or hadn't been paying his tithe or whatever, but Ellen White says he was converted in 1888 at Minneapolis. So much so, she says that they could all see it. It was obvious. Question is, what made it obvious? You know, I mean, it's not like he stopped drinking alcohol, right? What made it obvious? And the answer to that is basically, at that time, Dr. Kellogg developed an interest to help other people. He became a very generous guy. He had not been. He became a very generous guy. He had, his, he had his strengths and his faults and his weaknesses like everybody else in the world, but he became a very generous guy. One of the first things he did is he said, what about orphans? We've got a lot of orphans in the Adventist church. And for our population back then, we certainly had more then than we do now. Of course, it's, you know, 100 years ago, life expectancy wasn't as high. And so he said, what are we going to do about orphans? And he went to Ellen White and he said, why don't we start an orphanage? And she said, that's an excellent idea. We're, we're years behind in that. Other, other denominations are doing a far better job of that kind of thing than we are. And so he, he started pushing for an orphanage. That was one of his, his first steps of carrying out what previously had been known as the benevolent work. You'll find Ellen White in early days of the, uh, you know, from like 1855 onward uh, up until 1893 at least, she talks about the benevolent work. She didn't use the expression medical missionary work. I didn't come until 
1890s. Okay? But she talked about the benevolent work. She talked about the Christian help work. I like that. It's a pretty straightforward title. I can, I can relate to things that make good sense to me. Um, and so um, Dr. Kellogg began pressing those issues to the forefront. Um, and um, let me get this going here. My apologies. I should get that, get that rolling. Um, <clears throat> The sad thing about the orphanage is that with more than a year of fundraising through the church, we didn't have enough money to, to begin anything. And at that time, a, a non-Adventist came along and gave us $30,000, which in those years was a lot of money, and, and built a, a fine orphanage. That's a key point, is that uh, we didn't do it. Okay? Um, that would have been in the spring of 1892, Mrs. Carolyn Haskell, no relation to Stephen Haskell, gave $30,000 and they started the orphanage. And Kellogg was, was kind of on a roll right at that point. He'd had a, um, he'd had, uh, a young lady from Chicago, non-Adventist, who'd come to the sanitarium for treatment, stayed for a number of months, very much appreciated the nursing that she'd received there. and. Um, she went back home to Chicago to have an operation, which turned out to be unsuccessful, and she eventually died. But on her deathbed, she extracted from her father a promise. She said, Father, you have to put up the money to go get a Battle Creek nurse to come here to Chicago. We need nurses like that helping people in Chicago. And so um, the, the visiting nurses program was begun in 1891, also funded by a non-Adventist. Okay. Um, in the fall of 1891, and we'll go to the paper here at this point. Notice the, uh, the large first subheading there, the Christian help bands. I'm just going to read a little bit here. This kind of missionary work is probably the most basic and foundational of all. We'll be looking at a more formalized variation. But before this approach ever came about, the spirit of prophecy had called for years for individuals to do this work on their own. Okay? And here's the little quote that um, comes from the Medical Missionary Magazine. It says, a little meeting of sanitarium helpers presided over by Dr. Kellogg met at 8 o'clock on the evening of November 15, 1892, to consider the question of Christian help work. Dr. Kellogg spoke of the good such a band of workers could do in looking up those in the city who were not able to take care of themselves and providing as far as possible food, clothing, and such other things as they were in need of, and helping them in every way to a higher appreciation of life and to know how to care for themselves and their children. This was the beginning of the organized effort of the Christian help bands. Now, this sounds like small potatoes, but it's not. This is huge, actually. Okay. Carrying on here, just want to cover some of this paper. This turn of events was something new for the Adventists at Battle Creek. Like most new ideas or programs, this one needed some explaining. Wisely, it wasn't until the dust had settled and the work had taken on a bit of routine that both an announcement and an explanation of the program was provided for all to read. The account above continues. It says nine individuals were chosen to make up the first band. A leader appointed, a gospel worker, a missionary nurse, three young men chosen as burden bearers, and three young women as mother's helpers. Simple, simple stuff. Okay? This original band worked on for some weeks, devoting from one to six or more hours each week to the work and calling on others to help them when they found more than they could do. Others became anxious to aid, and names enough were soon handed to the committee to make four new bands, which were also set to work. You know, just you know, start running the math on this. We're talking nine people per band. Now we've got five bands going. That means we've got 45 people spending from one to six hours a week just helping their neighbors. Simple. The call boys of the sanitarium, the little errand runner guys, right? Okay. The call boys of the sanitarium, not to be outdone in good works by their elders, also formed themselves into an auxiliary band. And though they could not work in just the same lines, have proved themselves very efficient in various directions, such as looking up old clothing and gathering up, distributing it, finding cases in need of help, running of errands, etc. The whole number of visits made by these bands, as collected from the weekly reports, is 293. Okay, now this, this account is, is being written here, what was it, in April 
1893. So it's not that far from November. Okay, so from November to April, that's how many months it had been. They'd made 293 visits. Okay, interesting. But this falls somewhat short of the actual number. The instances where relief had been afforded to individuals are 263. Some of the weekly reports of the bans are very suggestive. And we would perhaps use a different phrase on that now than uh, <laughs> suggestive has taken on such a negative connotation, but anyhow. Of course, they are too brief to be more than hints of the work done, but they speak for themselves and show the nature of the work better than could be done in any other way. Let us look them over and gather some items. Two old ladies who needed wood split and had no one to do it for them were reported to the burden bearers, and a later report shows that the wood was split to the great gratitude of the lonely old ladies. That's pretty high-tech stuff. <laughs> you know, that's, that's complicated. Okay. A widow woman was found who was dependent on the renting of her rooms for support. Rumors were looked up and sent to her. She was put in the way of self-support. A young woman was found in sore need of medical treatment. It was reported to the hospital and treatment secured. Okay, now that's getting a little more complicated. I'm not an MD. Maybe I couldn't have done that part. Maybe I've got an MD friend. Maybe he could. Okay? It's, you know, it's taking the networking of the Adventist church and using it to help other people, basically what it boils down to. Two cases on Blank Street in need of clothing. The clothing was supplied. A mother trying to take care of herself and her child by washing was helped to find work. And I'm going to skip on down through the rest of these. Uh, you can read them, but they pretty much say the same sort of thing. In other words, normal people with normal, simple, small-scale problems were being helped out. Okay, So please go to page two and then drop on down. Um, Verify these things are working here now. Um, <clears throat> drop on down to where the text comes back out again. This article was written no more than five months after the original band was formed. A lot had happened in those months, but the genius of the plan was that, except for the more serious medical cases, the services rendered were such that just about anyone could have a part. In fact, the article tells us that the idea was catching on. Quote, quite recently, more names have been offered for Christian help work and have just been organized into bands and territory laid out for them. There are now 16 bands at the sanitarium besides the band of call boys. Okay, somebody do the math. 16 times 9. Well, it's 116 minus 16, right? <laughs> okay. 144 people going out from one to six hours a, a week. It's not high tech. It's not... Well, they didn't have rocket science in those days, but it wasn't brain surgery, <laughs> okay? I can make a very strong case that, the, that this as the capstone, the Christian help work, formed the basis for Ellen White's comment, which appeared in the review in November of 1892. She said, the time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry has begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. Notice she says the revelation, not the proclamation. The revelation. We'll see some quotes dealing with that in a little bit. Okay, let's go on. <clears throat> in the years following the launch of the Christian help bands, there was a lot going on with Kellogg. The Chicago City Mission and his relationship with the ministry of the church, not all that Kellogg was doing was good, nor was it all bad. At the risk of oversimplifying, let's call the Christian help bands good and the overextended work down in Chicago bad. Okay. Now, this does get very complex. As you work through the time period of 1894, 1895, 1896, up till about 1897, um, the, the work down in Chicago started off quite simple, but it kept growing and growing and growing and it became problematic, okay? And so by 1897, Ellen White was, very, was, was issuing some rather strong cautions to Dr. Kellogg and telling him, Doctor, your work is, is out of proportion. Your work is, is getting off the track down here in Chicago. But I want to try and parse out, and this is, this is complicated, okay? Um, it's, it's a little bit tricky as you go reading through all the counsels from Ellen White to Dr. Kellogg during that four-year period. What part applies to Chicago? What part applies to what was going on back up in Battle Creek and in other cities? They started Christian help bands in Ann Arbor, Michigan, for instance. And they started uh, other bands down all the way down into other states. We're reporting through the pages of the medical missionary 
periodical, that was the, the actual title of the paper, was the Medical Missionary, uh, they were reporting the inauguration of Christian help bands going on in these other places. And so again, as I say, oversimplifying, the Christian help bands, they were good. The work down in Chicago was getting too big, too complicated, and was not producing such great results. Okay, So let's go to the top of the right-hand column here on page two. The Lord has been speaking through testimonies to Seventh-day Adventists. Those who have had great light have been largely the subjects of labor. What she's saying there is we keep working for the Adventists. We keep going round and round talking to the choir. Okay? Those who have had great light have been largely the subjects of labor. Those who have received so much labor have not been glorifying God. Oh, how much the people of God have yet to learn before they will realize it is not those who know the truth who are to be forever favored with the work of the ministers. But the ministers should work with their God-given ability to erect the standard of truth among those who have not even heard that there is such a people in the world as Seventh-day Adventists. Those who flatter themselves that they are the children of God are yet indifferent to perishing souls around them. Ignorant, you may say, they are. Yes. And so would you be if you had been in their place. But if they are ignorant, they need enlightenment. They need the very information their brethren can impart to them in the way of life. The church ought to have taken up this work in every conference. Now, what's she talking about right here? The church ought to have taken up this work in every conference. She's talking about the Christian help bands. Okay? This work is the work that churches have left undone. And they... What are those next two words? They cannot prosper. I just want to stop here just a second. I just want to make a philosophical point. Life has to have some challenges in it. If you have no challenges in your life, it's boring. But choose your challenges well. Because there are some challenges which will defeat you. And I personally... I like a challenging life. It's a great concept. But I'm not going to take a challenge when God says I'm going to lose. What's the point? And right here she says, these churches cannot prosper. We'll finish the sentence now. Until they have taken hold of this work in the cities, in highways, and in hedges. You know, I would, I would urge that sentence on the attention of our church. <laughs> In every conference, this is the work. And they cannot prosper until they take it up. Then, implying a condition here, then angels of God will cooperate with human instrumentalities and a religious system will be inaugurated to relieve the necessities of suffering human beings who are in physical, mental, and moral need. A religious system. This is not just a collection of individual effort. God's calling on us at some stage in this process. We're not there yet, just you know, my opinion. We're not there. But at some point, he wants this thing organized, systematized. He wants this to be the worldwide face of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Going on. The very work Dr. Kellogg has been managing is the kind of work the whole of our churches are bound to do under covenant relation to God. What does it mean to be bound? Bound. If my arms are bound, I can't get out of that situation. I am stuck. Bound under covenant relation. What's the covenant? <laughs> the covenant is salvation, people. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is the life of the church. We are bound to do the very kind of work that Dr. Kellogg has been managing. That's significant. Going on. <clears throat> there are some who withhold themselves from their fellow men and shut themselves within themselves, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is made void by their practice. Their words go as far as expressions of warmth, that the poor are not clothed, nor fed, nor warmed, nor taught, nor given personal labor. You know, that, that's, that's, that's a description of me. I'm, I'm pretty good at expressing sympathy. 
I've got a lot to learn about doing anything useful about it. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying, but I'll just be honest. I, I've got a lot to learn. They, including myself, do not know what service, unselfish service to God means. I, I love this. You know, I, used, I taught English for 20 years, right? And it's not common that you can find Ellen White using certain literary techniques. This is about as close as she comes to sarcasm. It's great. Notice this. Many consider that it will sometime be their duty, but it cannot be now. They contemplate it afar off as something we are not ready for when it should have been brought into life at the very beginning of their religious experience. This is square one. This is what you teach the person when they, before they go into the baptistry. Before they go into the baptistry. The principle of Christ is the principle of service. Self-abnegation. Desire of Ages, that beautiful, was it the first chapter or the third chapter, I forget which one it is. She talks about everything in the world takes to give. Takes to give. She talks about the Dead Sea, right? You've all heard the illustrations. We all know this stuff. This is not rocket science. We just haven't done it. <laughs> That's the only problem. Okay. It should have been the very beginning of their religious experience. How long shall the Lord wait for the churches to take up the work he has appointed them? <clears throat> if they had done their part, Dr. Kellogg would have had only his proportionate part. But those who ought to have taken a large part in this line of work are content to watch and criticize and conjecture. This is the history of the 1890s, and I'm going to just throw some stuff out real fast. Dr. Kellogg was persecuted out of the church almost. I'm not saying he didn't make his mistakes, and no, I'm not a big fan of pantheism. Okay, But that stuff all came later. Dr. Kellogg, Ellen White says that, that there were individuals within the church, and specifically some within the ministry, who made war upon Dr. Kellogg in order to make themselves look better. He was criticized. He was hounded. She says that his work was, was continually made more than twice as hard as it should have been. The ministers, and she picks on them, and I'm not saying that uh, we should pick on the ministers uh, any more so than probably than the, uh, the laity. Okay, I think we all fit in the same boat. But basically... They didn't like what Kellogg was doing. He was criticized for the very nature of the work he was doing, which was this Christian help work and the orphanage and the visiting nurses work. Because it's messy. It's messy work. Some of you are medical professionals. I'm, I'm not. I had a little experience with it once upon a time. You know, working in a small sanitarium. I don't think I quite made it to the level of orderly. <laughs> but bedpans are messy, pretty much by definition. <laughs> Helping people in their homes can be really messy. I don't know if you've ever walked into a home that there was serious danger. If that stuff tipped over, you might get killed. You know, it's a mess in some places. Now, all our work is not called for the most, shall I say, degraded segments of society. That's not where all our work needs to go. But some of it does. And as a church, we didn't like what Kellogg was advocating. And he got a lot of flack over it. Let's go on. We're top left, more or less, at page three, one paragraph down. God has not forsaken his people but his people have forsaken him. Those in Battle Creek should have worked for the ones who needed their help. Dr. Kellogg took up the work they did not do. The spirit of criticism shown to his work from the first has been very unjust and has made his work hard. The lack of sympathy his brethren have shown him has prepared the way for the work he has been doing in criticizing them. The Lord has no justification for any such work. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but if somebody's mean to you, after a while, it gets pretty easy to be kind of negative about them. And Dr. Kellogg was good at it. It's, I, I know this is going to put my own bad attitude on display, but it's fun sometimes reading the exchanges between Kellogg 
and his opponents within the church. Kellogg always won. <laughs> he was a sharp guy. But he, you know, when, when uh, they, yeah, well, let's just put it that way. He was, he was quicker on his feet, and he always had a comeback. But it was destroying his own soul because he fell into the habit of criticizing the ministry. Ellen White cautioned him about it, told him not to do that over and over. But they kept criticizing him, making war upon him, criticizing him for doing the very work that he knew God had called him to do. What do you call someone who attacks you for doing God's work? You know, I might be tempted to say something along the lines of the agent of the devil. Should I say that about the General Conference president? <laughs> yeah. And without being too pointed on it, A.G. Daniels sometimes did things to Kellogg that weren't right or fair. And Kellogg took offense. So that's just kind of the history of it. Let's go on. <clears throat> Had the church done in different localities the work given them by God, had they followed the example left them by Christ, there would, be, there would now be centers all through America. Catch that. Plants would be established in many places. This you'll find is a key element of the Lord's plan for the development of medical mission work and city work in particular. We aren't supposed to ideally have huge centers. It works like paint. Paint is good. You can have a five-gallon bucket of it, and you could put it in the corner, take the lid off, and it would eventually dry. It wouldn't do anybody any good. You could take the five gallons, and you could, well, maybe not the whole walls here, but anyhow, you could paint a lot of the wall. It's a lot better when it's spread out. Medical missionary work is a lot better when it's spread out. Okay? Just remember that. Okay? We would have centers all through America. Plants would be established in many places. There would not be a great showing in Chicago alone. And this became Kellogg's downfall. He was so mad at the ministry, he, I'm putting words in his mouth, but it's like he basically said, those guys are such ignorance. I'll show them how to do the Lord's work. Is not this the great Chicago mission that I have built? Okay? And that was Kellogg's downfall. It became huge. Find all that on my website, but won't go into that anymore. Here, okay. The work would be multiplied in many places with the full cooperation of the institutions established in Battle Creek. The past should be subject for keen regret. The Lord would now have, have the medical missionary work recognized as the helping hand of God, but this work has been carried too heavily in one place, Chicago, when plans should have been made in many places. <clears throat> Aside from this kind of inspired approval, there is also a special relationship between this work and the loud cry. And I alluded to that already. Um, there, there are just a ton of links which tie the, the message of righteousness by faith and the loud cry to medical missionary work. And, and I've got several presentations and sermons available on that on my website, so I'm not going to go into that any further. If I can um, get this going now. And where is my clicker? Um, okay. Well, the clicker appears to have disappeared, so we'll go with an alternate clicker. And I trust. Oh, you've got it. Okay, there it is. Bless you. Okay. <clears throat> true interpretation of the gospel. Okay, somehow we're not communicating. Uh, okay, I'll go back to this and this work. Yeah, this this will work. I've, I've got papers up here, so that'll, but we'll be fine. I've, I've got my, my trusty backup, so it'll work. Okay. I'm going to argue uh, in a polite way, that we often completely fail of understanding what the gospel is really all about. Okay? The true interpretation of the gospel. This is a, a partial quote. You'll see the quote probably on about the last screen here. Notice she says the true interpretation. Do I have any grammarians here? What, is, what part of speech is the? Which article? It's the definite article, yeah, okay? It's not a interpretation or an interpretation. It is 
the interpretation, the true interpretation. Just hang on to that. Okay. <clears throat> Why does all this matter? Well, and again, tying back to Ellen White's comment, the time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun, the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the angel, the light of the angel, whose glory shall fill the whole earth. This was put in the review, uh, November 22, 1892. Two and a half months later, in February 1893, there was a general conference session. I just kind of put yourself in that situation. The prophet says, the loud cry has begun. And now we have a GC session. You know, there's going to be a little bit, a little bit of a buzz going on, okay? 1893 GC session, some of you may be familiar. That's when A.T. Jones preached his 26-part uh, Third Angel's Message series, right? Okay. Dr. Kellogg stands up. He had a series of presentations in 1893. He stands up to speak. <clears throat> he said a few things I wish he wouldn't, wouldn't have said, you know. But he had one main point he was driving home. And um, basically it is this. The key theological idea that he was stressing in all these talks was that the loud cry is what you find described in the latter section of Isaiah 58. Okay? Remember Isaiah 58? What, what comes at the end? All these promises. Then the glory of the Lord shall be your rearward. You know, I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. You will ride on the high places of the earth. Uh, you will call and I will answer. Here I am. You know, all of these promises, Kellogg said, that's the loud cry. And it's all conditional on what it says in the middle section of Isaiah 58. Deal your bread to the hungry. Bring the poor that are cast out to your house. Clothe the naked. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity. Then, three thens, two ifs. Kellogg said this, if the loud cry has been begun by our people, it must be because we have just begun to do a little in the way of letting our light shine. But we have done so little in that way that it seems to me that before the loud cry will make any great noise in the world, we will have to let our light shine a great deal brighter than we have ever yet done. Because the works come first. The light must shine through these good works before we can be called the repairers, the breach, and restorer paths to dwell in. For that promise comes after all these conditions, you see. Do you follow his point? It's a pretty simple point. He goes on. He says, we had a testimony over 30 years ago. Now, this is 1893, so he's going back to 1860. Yeah, it's, so, it's so interesting to read as he's talking. He says, Ellen White said this two years ago. <laughs> and it's, it, was so, you know, it was so recent for him. You know, two years ago she said this, and we haven't done it yet. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking as I'm reading this for the first time in my life last summer, these talks incidentally were not reported in the General Conference Daily Bulletin. None of Kellogg's talks were, were printed uh, that year. Um, so I'd never seen this until a, a year ago. But anyhow, he says, we had a testimony over 30 years ago saying that we as a people were to rise higher and higher, but it does not appear from testimonies received at different times since that one was given that we have risen perceptibly from that time until now, a period of over 30 years, when a large part of the, oh, excuse me, how is the loud cry going to be given through us when a large part of the denomination are 30 years behind time and sounding a note altogether out of tune? We must do the work which the Lord has told us to do and which we have left undone. We must do our duty in relation to health principles and benevolence in connection with other questions. We must heed the light and accept the whole truth before we can expect the Lord to sound the loud cry through us. Now, <clears throat> in the whole context of this, when, he, when Kellogg says benevolence there, um, what he's saying is, is the Christian health work. That's the benevolent work. It was known for years as the benevolent work. Actually, in 1868, George, or James, uh, James White took the lead in founding, in, in organizing the Seventh-day Adventist Benevolent Association in 1868, and it just really hadn't accomplished much. Kellogg caught a little flack. He had people in his audience saying, the loud cry has already begun, like attacking him as if you know, he's, he's, he's doubting Ellen White. You know, 1893, Kellogg 
was not doubting Ellen White. He was a little confused. He was perplexed in the situation at this point, perhaps. He was not doubting Ellen White. Um, uh, there's a great letter from George Butler. When, when Kellogg was doubting Ellen White years later, George Butler wrote Kellogg a letter, and he said, you know, brother, this is back in the early 90s. Says, there were times when I think you believed Ellen White more than you believed the Bible. And he's trying to get him to turn on his, you know, turn around uh, 10, 15 years later. Kellogg was not doubting Ellen White. He was just simply saying, how can this be? How does this make sense? We haven't done Isaiah 58. How can we expect the fulfillment of the last part of Isaiah 58? And the, the, the irony of the whole thing is that Kellogg kind of sold himself short. In the year prior to that statement from Ellen White, he had let out in four distinct different branches of benevolent work and medical missionary work. He'd instituted them. He'd gotten them started in the church. They were all accepted programs. They weren't prospering. They weren't getting a lot of attention. There were a lot of people who were happy to ignore them, but they were started. It was a small beginning of carrying out Isaiah 58. And Ellen White said that the loud cry had begun. And it's like Kellogg said, you know, until we get Isaiah 58 perfect and down pat, I won't believe that there's a loud cry. Or, to be honest, I think it's probably more like this. He says, I can't believe that the Lord would bless in some theological sense when the brethren are still attacking me for doing what he's told me to do. Does that make sense? There's so much. You know, it's, it's so fascinating when you get back and you start understanding the personalities involved in our, our church history. Little, uh, huge issues hinge on the very small events sometimes. Okay. But anyhow, perhaps he had sold his own work short and despised the day of small beginnings. We're not supposed to do that, right? There is a, uh, a fascinating but lengthy story about the whole deterioration of Kellogg's uh, relationship with the ministry, and you'll find that on my website, because we're not going to go through that now. So uh, we don't have time for that, but we're going to summarize a little bit. So let's see here. Different ones, Ellen White said, made the work of Dr. Kellogg as hard as possible. In order to build themselves up, they made war upon him. And I already mentioned some of this. Kellogg got tired of that, retaliated, and his patience ran out. Uh, eventually, the pantheism issue came up, right? And uh, in a lot of people's minds at the GC and other people who had to deal with Kellogg, the pantheism thing was like the final straw. Yes. Oh, we can't, we can't have this. And there's truth to that. I'm no, I'm no fan of pantheism. But notice the date on this statement right here. This is the General Conference of 1903. This is a full year after the writing of Living Temple. And it's probably the single strongest, most defensive speech that Ellen White ever gave in Dr. Kellogg's behalf. She was trying desperately to hang on to this guy. She was not accepting pantheism. She was not excusing his pride. She was trying desperately. She had promised his mother on her deathbed that she would do everything she could to see John saved. Um, that's not the only reason, I don't think, but anyhow. And this was, as I said, this was a sermon, public sermon, at the general conference. You know, I mean, Ellen White, wow, you know, I mean, she stands up and she's speaking in the general conference, she says, the ministers have made war on this guy over here. That's, that's pretty heavy stuff. Okay, well, <coughs> the work had to go on, whether Kellogg was there or not. It took a special focus on cities, kind of, you know, it had been, the benevolent work had kind of been, what should I say, a little, um, a little nebulous. It was all applicable, let's put it that way. But then along came, uh, this, this quotation here is from 1909. I put it up there because it summarizes it very nicely. But the, the focus on cities came more just about the time, just shortly after Ellen White came back from Australia in September 1900. She came back to the, the States, and she began focusing there. A lot of her comments more in connection 
although there's a whole history, and, and you can find that on our website too, uh, there's a whole history of Ellen White trying to establish a model ministry in Australasia. You may have heard that you know, Avondale was to be the model school, right? Okay. She was doing the same thing with the ministry. And it got to the point where they said, we do not want ministers. We want nurses that can give Bible studies, and we want Bible uh, workers who can nurse. That's what we want. And so the entire ministry of the church, as it was being established in Australia during the 1890s under Ellen White's guidance, was to be a medical ministry. Uh, but anyhow, so the cities, okay? Henceforth, she said, medical missionary work is to be carried forward with an earnestness with which it has never yet been carried. The work is the door through which the truth is to find entrance to the large cities. And why is that important, right? There is no change in the messages God has seen, sent in the past. The work in the cities is the essential work for this time. When the cities are worked as God would have them, the result will be the setting and operation of a mighty movement such as we have not yet witnessed. She's talking about, very clearly in context, she's talking about the loud cry, <coughs> the latter rain. Kellogg was right in what he said in 1893. And there's a whole uh, raft of, of uh, information that can go into that. And again, I'll refer you to my website. But we want to catch a little more history. It hadn't worked in Battle Creek. Battle Creek has gone down, she said. So try, try again. Uh, White did not give up. She says here, I want to tell you that when the gospel ministers and the medical missionary workers are not united, there is placed in our churches the worst evil that can be placed there. Now, as I said before, it's, it's hard to find Ellen White um, it's an, it's using certain literary uh, devices. Sounds like we're getting somebody else's benefit here. Um, this, is, this is not hyperbole. She's not exaggerating here. Now, when she says the very worst evil, well, I didn't say very. The worst evil. She says the worst evil. Again, grammarians. What kind of what part of speech is worst? Do you remember? I heard it someplace. A superlative. You can't go worse than worst. Okay. The worst evil is what happens when the medical work and the ministerial work are not united. What's going on with that? Okay. Going on, our medical missionaries ought to be interested in the work of our conferences, and our conference workers ought to be as much interested in the work of our medical missionaries. Okay, there were lessons to be learned from the Kellogg debacle and warnings to be given. The whole worst evil issue is one of the more ominous warnings. Again, I've got a whole sermon on that. I'll go to the website. Notice the reference on this quotation. The point is, this is from Loma Linda Message, the point is that the focus of medical missionary work was transferred to Loma Linda. Okay, Kellogg went down, Loma Linda was coming up. In the process, God went to a lot of trouble to give them the best opportunity he could to get it right. He arranged for the purchase of the property at a fantastic bargain price. I don't know if you remember the story, right? Okay. Um, they ended up buying the place for one-third of what it was listed originally at a fire sale price to begin with. Okay, and the Lord held that. And they, they bought it at great price. God provided funds in a miraculous manner to pay for it more than once. They were sitting, you know, they were down to the last minute. Uh, John Burden, the fellow who engineered the purchase of Loma Linda, was being roundly criticized for having gone directly against the advice, or actually the, the specific direction, command of his conference president. And they were up to a situation now where they had a lot of money invested and it was all going to be lost if they didn't meet a payment. And the payment was due at noon, it was now 10 o'clock. They were meeting an emergency session and the president said, Brother Burden, what do you suggest we do now? He says, why don't we pray? Prayer is always appropriate, Brother Burden. Why don't we pray? So they all knelt and they pray and they were done praying. And he says, now what do you suggest, Brother Burden? He says, well, why don't we wait and see if anything comes in the mail? Well, yes, Brother Burden, what an excellent idea. Let's wait and see if something comes in the mail. And a check from Ocean City, New Jersey, I think it was, or someplace in New Jersey. What else is it? Ocean? That sounds about right. Someplace, someplace, from a woman unknown to everyone in the room, came along with a check for the five thousand dollars they needed to get down the street about a half a mile to the bank in the next twenty minutes, and they did. So the Lord was the Lord was in this thing. That's my, that's my point there. I spent more time on that than I needed to. 
People don't know this one. God completely rewrote the California State Medical Licensure Law in 1907. Completely rewrote the law. The entire law was thrown out and new law was brought in. I, I, I mapped this all through. You know, there are, there's, there's a whole herd of little guys in, in Sacramento that will do nothing but go track down obscure legal issues for you, all for free, and then mail it to Kansas. It's great. Um, the, the law was completely rewritten and left, I mean, we basically had a blank check. We could have established any kind of medical work we wanted to at that point in Loma Linda. All we needed was a state charter, which we already had, okay? He provided a ton of inspired counsel on what to do and how to do it. Have you ever read Loma Linda Messages? I'm not saying you have to, but it's a great book. And it's all about Loma Linda, what to be done there, okay? Uh, another book, even better in some ways, is the book Medical Practice and Educational Program at Loma Linda. It was published by the White Estate in 1952, and it's, 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 it's evaporated. Nobody even knows it existed, but you can find it on our website, so go check that one out. It's a great book, too. Okay. Um, medical Practice and the Educational Program at Loma Linda. Yeah, yeah, fantastic, fascinating book. Uh, it, includes, uh, it includes the... Uh, so minutes have, from board meetings and things like that, which makes it great for a historian. Okay, and last but not least, they put John Burden at the head of the work. John Burden is my hero. And in the back, Out of all the people that Ellen White wrote letters to, he was number six in the most letters received. He was never reproved once. Never reproved. He's like Daniel. There are no recorded sins. I am sure that you know all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And he probably, you know, but he was never reproved. He just did what God told him to do and what spirit prophecy told him to do. He was in charge at Loma Linda. Everything this was this was you know the Lord was doing everything he could to uh, to make this all go. There and then in 1908, that, God sent a remarkable man to Loma Linda, not as a teacher, but as a student, okay? This guy had been a newspaper man. I don't know if that means he was a publisher or a reporter or what he was. He'd been a law student. He was a breeder of thoroughbred racehorses, and he'd been a gold prospector. Quite a resume. The important thing is that way out in the desert chasing after gold, he got sick. An old Adventist by the name of Bell took him in and nursed him back to health. Along the way, he was converted from his atheism by a combination of medical missionary work in practice and a copy of Desire of Ages. It was thrown at him when he was arguing so much that Papa Bell said, you know, you're well enough. I don't have to sit here and listen to you. Read that. I'm going to go find some gold. And he, he went out and he left the guy there with the book. <laughs> in the fall of 1908, this fairly young man, reasonably young, showed up at Loma Linda. He'd just been baptized. He, was going to, he says, I, I, I need to be a minister. What, what do you do to be a minister in this church? He said, well, you probably ought to go to Union College. Well, where's that? He says, it's in Nebraska. Well, okay. He says, oh, I'm going to go to Nebraska. And it was like on his way to the train station. And somebody says, well, you know, have you heard about the medical missionary course at Loma Linda? He says, the what? Medical missionary course. Yeah, well, tell me about this. He says, yeah. What's Loma Linda? Where's Loma Linda? I mean, he's in California, but he hadn't heard of it yet. He says, that's obviously, that's, that's, that's a no-brainer. That's what saved me. <laughs> People love the thing that saves them, right? You know, that's what saved me. So he goes down to Loma Linda, fall of 1908, signs up for the two-year medical missionary course. It means he graduates in the spring of 1910, okay? During the night of February 27, 1910, the unworked cities were represented before me as a living reality, and I was plainly instructed that there should be a decided change from past methods of working. For months, the situation had been impressed on my mind, and I urged that companies be organized and diligently trained to labor in our important cities. How to make this happen? How to make this happen? That was February 27, 1910. In April of that year, she went down to Loma Linda, and she got the most reliable man she knew, whose name was? John Burton, okay? And Roderick S. Owen, who she described as being the best Bible teacher in the denomination. She said, we have to have the best Bible teacher in the denomination for Loma Linda. And they said, well, who's that? She said, Roderick Owen. Okay. So she called those two guys and possibly a couple, one or two others. And she, and I have this only verbally, right? Nobody ever wrote this down, but this, this is the way the verbal accounts have gone. She basically said, brethren, gospel, medical, missionary, evangelism. Make it happen. 
I'm placing it on your shoulders. God will hold you accountable. So now we've got an ad hoc committee of you know, three or four individuals with a responsibility before God. Well, they all had full-time jobs. And, and pray tell me, when did a committee ever actually do anything useful? You know? So all committees do is they delegate. And so they immediately said, well, we've got to find the guy. We've got to find somebody. And they looked around, and, and, and their attention was drawn to this fellow who had been converted two years before. You know, the Bible says lay hands suddenly on no man, but, you know, he had, he had impressed them seriously in the, that two years. And so they went to him, and they said, Brother Tyndall, <clears throat> would you take up the work of gospel, medical, missionary, evangelism? I, I'm in your way. I'm sorry about that. Um, John H. N. Tyndall. Most people have never heard of him. <clears throat> He pioneered gospel, medical, missionary evangelism in California, Indiana, Virginia, Wisconsin, Oklahoma, and Texas. Okay. Uh, I spent 10 years in Oklahoma, so I was kind of interested in that. Looked that one up a little bit. When he was in Oklahoma, <laughs> Billy Sunday was also in Oklahoma. Now, if you remember Billy Sunday, he was kind of a Pentecostal type of evangelist back in the day. The Daily Oklahoman, the uh, newspaper of record down there, made an interesting comment. They said, Sunday, Billy Sunday, got the crowds. Tyndall got the converts. <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, that's what formed the Oklahoma City Church, was, was his, his crusade. He did the same thing down in Texas. Dallas, Fort Worth, that church came about because of John Tyndall's work. Okay? Tyndall combined medical education with his gospel presentations, even though he wasn't a doctor. That's what he'd been trained to do. Oh, well, where do you learn that, you ask? Okay. Well, some little school in Southern California, right, that back in the day was following this council. Loma Linda is to be not only a sanitarium, but an educational center for the training of gospel medical missionary evangelists. Well, that's what he'd done. He'd taken the two-year gospel medical missionary evangelist course. Tyndall was running these evangelistic series, and after he'd gone through five of these series, <clears throat> he went to his conference leaders, and he said, brethren, we're not being faithful to the council. I said, what's that? He said, the council was, we need companies of workers. He said, I don't have a company. I've just got, there's just three of us. That's not a company. He said, I need a company of workers. And I don't really know how the conversation went, but something along the lines of, well, what a coincidence. You don't have a company, and we don't have a budget. I'm sorry, make do what you can. <laughs> you know, just, just figure it out for yourself, okay? And so he did. Now, we have the records. Fortunately, they've been preserved. <clears throat> For those five evangelistic series that he'd been doing, with combining the medical work with his evangelistic work, he had he'd been averaging 36 baptisms per series. Well, that's not bad. I have a few evangelist friends that would be very happy with 36 baptisms per series. Okay. But he said, the council calls for a company. I'm going to have a company of workers here. And he went out and he got himself a company. And we have the records for the next six series on average. 121 baptisms per series. Something was working right. It's, it's a good thing when that happens. Okay. Well, how did Tyndall get such good results? What sort of a company did he have? Well, here's his, uh, these are the three paid employees. He had himself, a medical helper, and a Bible worker. But that's not a company. But he didn't have a budget. So he went out and he got himself 18 volunteers. That looked like this. He had one singer, six nurses, and ten unspecified volunteers. Um, <clears throat> okay, I see what happened. Um, <clears throat> Tyndall kept on working, and um, finally in 1927, the uh, G.A. Roberts, the president of the California Conference, there was only one California Conference at that time, um, J. Roberts said, John, what you're doing, nobody else knows how to do. You, you've got to start a school. And so they started what was known as the Field Training School, the Field School of Evangelism out of uh, San Francisco. And um, Roberts told Tyndall, he says, listen, you need, you need, I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> Seems like it's a common refrain, but I don't have a lot of money. I've got, I've got a salary for one person. Find the best person you can anywhere in the denomination. I'll get him for you. Well, Tyndall chose a 21-year-old kid who had never worked for the denomination. Picked a 21-year-old kid. He'd, he'd met him a couple of years before at Loma Linda and was very impressed with this young guy. 
Roberts argued with him for three weeks. He said, no, John, you know, this, stop this stupid humility thing. Go get a big name. Go, you know, you know, go get someone with real talent. And, and, and Tino kept his guns. And he says, I, I, I want the kid. Why do you want a 21-year-old kid? He says, well, he's a godly young man. I got to know him. He impressed me. And he's never done it before. He doesn't think he knows how to do it. I don't have to untrain him. All I have to do is train him. You know, having worked most of my life with teenagers, there's some truth in that. <laughs> the 21-year-old uh, young gentleman worked with Tyndall for 10 years and uh, branched out into his own uh, career, shall we say, of gospel medical missionary evangelism. I have a picture of the 21-year-old uh, taken later in life. You may or may not recognize him. Um, <clears throat> This is WD for Z. The uh, training school fell apart in 1937, partially because of uh, a split of the California conference into two conferences at that time. It was the Depression. Money was tight. There was a little politics involved, one thing or another. Funding died. Uh, Tyndall was ill at that point. The whole thing kind of fell apart. For Z kind of kicked around for a few years, still doing his, the work on his own, kind of as a freelance you know, uh, evangelist, which wasn't well received, um, much more of an emphasis on you got to be a conference employee to be, you know, reputable in those days. Finally, by 1941, he'd come to the conclusion, he says, listen, if gospel medical missionary evangelism is God's tool for the loud cry, there's got to be a school someplace that teaches it. There wasn't. Unfortunately, the last graduate from the two-year medical missionary course from Loma Linda was in 1925 happened to be the year that the 21-year-old kid graduated. Um, they were training nothing but physicians at that point. There's nothing wrong with training physicians, but they'd lost one aspect of the work, let's put it that way. And so Frizee said there's got to be a, a place to start that, to do that, to provide that kind of a training. And so in 1941-42, he started a little operation you may have heard of down in Georgia, right? A little place down there in... in um, Wildwood, okay, Wildwood Institute. You know, I, I've met Elder Frizzi just a couple of times. I never got to know him well. I know a lot of people who did. Uh, I've learned a lot of him in that way, and I've read a lot of his stuff and whatnot, and I have a great deal of respect for him, but I have to say that he was not particularly successful in what he set out to do. As near as I can tell, the first person that really came out under his tutelage and actually went into gospel medical missionary company evangelism wasn't until the 1960s. It's like 25 years before he got anybody to do what this, inst what this institution had been established to do. Uh, you may recognize, um, yeah, you'll probably recognize, as near as I know, the first person that came out doing gospel medical missionary evangelism was, uh, was this guy here. <laughs> In the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s, Mark and Tini Ernestine formed three evangelistic teams in the Southern New England Conference. They had from 17 to 19 workers, all on three and a half salaries, right? Um, they trained others. Uh, Brad Thorpe, you saw Brad last night. Brad got trained under Elder Frizee and then working with uh, Mark up in uh, Southern New England. Brad ran a gospel medical missionary company evangelism program up in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia for a number of years called Radiant Living Seminars. Um, that's where I got to know Brad. Uh, he um, happens to be a, a family friend of my wife's family, so I kind of got to know him that way. He actually performed the wedding for us. Um, if you were at ASI last year, uh, out in was it, Sacramento, you may remember Elder Wilson's closing Sabbath sermon. I mean, kind of closing, but the Sabbath sermon. He said quite a bit about comprehensive urban evangelism. Okay. Um, you know, it's a good thing. It's, it's a good thing. At this particular point in time, the Lord has individuals who actually know something about this stuff. Elder Wilson's uh, doctoral dissertation back in 1981 was on Ellen White's counsel for the medical missionary work in New York City. That's where he got his, 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 uh, his doctor's degree. Um, it's been a burden on his heart. Um, 
another example, some of you are familiar with the AMEN organization. I see we have some representatives at least, okay. Adventist Medical Evangelistic Network. Uh, doctors, dentists, who have in, in recent years, they're, you know, they're coming together, they're saying, what do we do? How do we as doctors and dentists, how do we as medical health professionals, how do we leverage that? How do we make this happen? Is this, there's this call for the unity of the, the ministerial and the medical. How do we make it happen? Okay, well, let's go on. There should be companies organized, educated most thoroughly to work as nurses, as evangelists, as ministers, as canvassers, as gospel students to perfect a character after the divine similitude. This is the company concept. God is calling not only upon ministers, but also upon physicians, nurses, canvassers, Bible workers, and other consecrated laymen of varied talents who have a knowledge of the present truth to consider the needs of the unwarmed cities. The company evangelistic method for the cities is, is what she's calling for. Well, where will this all end? There's a famous quote. We use this one all the time. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. We like to talk about that quote. We like to use that quote. It's a great quote. But sometimes I hear people use it, and it's, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like the, the perfectly, perfect reproduction of this character of Christ. It, it hinges on, on whether they eat Big Franks or, or whatever the other brand is or something, you know, I mean, it, it's like we can pick some of the most bizarre things to make, you know, this is the deciding, this is the great issue, you know, are you a vegan? Yeah. I happen to be a vegan, I like vegans, you know, but you know, I have some really good friends who aren't, I think they're doing the great work for the Lord, you know, I mean, that's not, that's not the perfect reproduction of the character of God. I'll give us a little break here on this, okay? Why don't we put that statement together with this other statement from the same book? The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. That's medical missionary work. God's purpose in committing to men and women the mission that he committed to Christ is to disentangle his followers from all worldly policy and give them a work identical with the work that Christ did. Identical. Our work is identical to the work that Christ did. I don't think that means we have to wear sandals and wander around in a, in a robe. I don't think that's what it's talking about. But when you stop and think about what did Jesus do, it's pretty simple. He mingled among men. He helped them out when they needed help. And he talked about God. It's not rocket science. The work that the great teacher did in connection with his disciples is the example we are to follow. It is only by an unselfish interest in those in need of help that we can give a practical demonstration of the truths of the gospel. The union of Christ-like work for the body and Christ-like work for the soul is the true interpretation of the gospel. Okay. Only, notice what she says, it is only by an unselfish interest in those in need of help that we can give a practical demonstration of the truths of the gospel. This is the loud cry. The loud cry is not a purely theological thing. Sure, there's some theology that goes along with it. And I'm not throwing away any doctrines or anything like that. I'm not, you know, I still love Jones and Wagner, you know. <laughs> okay, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a heretic here. But what I'm saying is that Kellogg was dead on in 19, 1893. He says, you can't preach the loud cry. You demonstrate the loud cry. The last ray of mercy to a dying world. It's the manifestation of the character of God. Not the explanation of it, it's the manifestation of it. When we have a worldwide church of seven million people, or yeah, yeah millions, not billions, good. Uh, 17, whatever the number is. 17 million people spending one to six hours a week helping their neighbors. Is that going to have any impact anywhere? The loud cry in some ways, is dirt simple. <laughs> Get out there and help somebody. Get out there and help somebody. That's the spirit of Christ. And I'm not degrading any doctrine. I still believe in the 2300 days. You know? I still know where dead people are. Okay? I'm not <laughs> I've, I've got all that down. I mean, give or take. I'm not trying to be too, too braggy about that. But I understand it. But we need people to go out and live it. You win the hearts of the people to the spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of service. And then you tell them, you know what? 
Here's this great thing about the state of the dead that keeps, Jesus gave, it, gave this to us to help us so we're not confused in the last days. You know? You're not saved by understanding the state of the dead. You could be lost if you were mixed up on it. And so Jesus says, here, you need to teach people that. But you teach them the spirit of Christ first. You get them involved in, med you know, in medical missionary work. Okay? Does that make sense? I hope that makes some sense. Um, <clears throat> There's our website. Uh, if you are interested in any of those topics, uh, I see I'm almost out of time. Um, foster simple work in your church. You know, foster practical uh, endeavors. Uh, promote, amen. Promote the. Uh, oh, there's there's several of them. Uh, the what is it? Mission to the many. Down here, uh, Pennsylvania Conference has a project. This is an excellent time. If you ever want to get into something, you want to get into it on the ground level. And right now is ground, ground level for medical missionary work in the Adventist Church. Okay? It's ground level for city work. There are a lot of things, and, and uh, the handout, we did not read it all. There's some more statements. Please look at the last page of that handout. Um, <clears throat> boy, they retypes at this thing, so I'm all confused now. But anyhow... <clears throat> Um, page five. Um, okay, I'm not finding it. Um, oh, bottom bottom left on page five. There we go. Search heaven and earth, and there is no truth revealed more powerful than that which is made manifest in works of mercy to those who need our sympathy and aid. You know, I'm a big fan of having power on my side when I need to get something done. You know? um, I can swing an axe, but you know, if I got a big tree, I'd rather have a power saw. <laughs> That's just, just the way it works. There is no truth more powerful than that which is made manifest in words of mercy to those who need our sympathy and aid. This is the truth as it is in Jesus. When those who profess the name of Christ shall practice the principles of the golden rule, the same power will attend the gospel as in apostolic times. What a great quote. What a great statement. I like it because I'm not a rocket scientist. And I'm not a brain surgeon, but I can deal with this. Thank you very much for your interest and your attention. Please remember to fill out that survey. They would appreciate that very much and uh, help them in their selections of things next year. I will have, um, as an aside, I, have a, a, I think I have about 10 copies of my book on Advanced History, if that's of interest to anybody. Um, you can pick one of those up. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we stand in awe of the simplicity of representing the Spirit of Christ. And yet, when we see our own hearts and all the things which tell us not to be self-sacrificing, we can easily stand in terror. And so we ask for your help. We ask for your converting power to change our hearts, to teach us the joy of a desire to bless and help others springing forth constantly from within. Father, we pray that you would provide us an understanding of, of your work and in all its weird and varying ramifications. Father, we've got so many cities today. It's going to be, everyone's going to be different. We've got so many different things to do in so many different ways. We pray that you would uh, give us wisdom to know what is best in each individual circumstance. Give us wisdom to be quick to encourage and quick to to improve and instruct and slow to discourage anyone trying to do your will. We just pray your blessing upon this particular aspect of your work, which you've said is of supreme importance. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless.